The Ruth Frost Parker Center for Abundant Aging presents The Art of Aging, information and tips on how to experience life more abundantly as we age. Our hosts are John King and Reverend Beth Long Higgins, Executive Director of the Ruth Frost Parker Center in Marion, Ohio, an organization affiliated with the United Church of Christ. One of the challenges we have in, in society in general where we're all living longer and we hope to live better is the decline of organizations and membership organizations. But particularly faith-based organizations, we are seeing not just a decline in membership, but we are seeing them closed. Even where I live, I remember one of our main churches that was not just for those who belong to the church, but they were the center of the community. The picnic, the raffles, everything that made it fun to be part of the community, let alone part of the church. Sadly, the baby boomers in particular started dropping out of membership groups. And so are Gen X, the folks that are in their late 40s, early 50s, and now even the millennials. The implication is that where do we go when we're older? Where are the social connections? Where are the services? Where is the hope? Hi, John. That was Joe Coughlin, the director of the MIT Age Lab, identifying an unfortunate trend that's reducing the opportunity for intergenerational contact in our society. Yes, Beth, and that's our topic today. We're going to look at several examples of how intergenerational contact benefits everyone, from preschool children to college students to people who are volunteering in retirement to help young people. We talked to Reverend Brian Newcomb from David's United Church of Christ in Kettering, Ohio. As you know, I am also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, but David's church really stands out in its success in drawing all ages to its congregation. Well, I hope this story provides some inspiration on how other congregations can build an intergenerational community. Let's hear Reverend Newcomb's perspective. I would say that our young families are here primarily because we have a vibrant Sunday school and our confirmation program. Because we've identified ourselves as a progressive congregation in a community that doesn't have a lot of churches that really celebrate their progressive values, uh, a lot of our younger families are, are finding themselves drawn to us. And I think that's what draws the older couples as well. Intellectually, we try to be vibrant and stimulating and we welcome people and we invite them to think for themselves. Uh, we have strong opinions ourselves, so we engage in conversations and dialogue and, uh, and we're respectful of a variety of views. So I think that's what's helping us in terms of attracting members who are both older and younger. When I started here and I was brand new and nobody knew me from Adam, I would say David's United Church of Christ and they would go, oh, you're the ones who do the backpack feeding program or you're the one who goes to the shelter and does, and they knew what we did. We have a warm wishes program that uh, creates uh, mittens, scarves and uh, hats for children primarily. And we give about 1800 sets of those, all three pieces and mostly folk in need folk who wouldn't have the extra income to go out and shop for their children and they get these warm items to and they're, they're aware that our church does that and they see us in the community and so I got all these pats on the back for how great my congregation was when I had nothing to do with it which was lovely because I suddenly saw what a meaningful asset this congregation has been in the community and people recognize that but it's been multi-generational and and the organic quality of that, um, you know, there's just a lot of folk who own this congregation who maybe don't worship with us very regularly, and we would love to see them more often, um, but we're grateful that they still see us as connected. Because like most congregations, we have uh, probably three times the membership that we see on a Sunday morning. But it's about relationships and multi-generational caring that is recognized because of the consistency and faithfulness of that and then the connectivity of the individuals in our congregation and all the things they do out in the world volunteering present in the community engaged in meaningful ministry and we just try to say all of that is important because of who we are as children of Christ as followers of Jesus we we do what we do in the community because this is what Jesus would have us do we have, we've actually got a number of participants now who've come to meet with me and they've told me that they don't really 
believe any of this. We have an atheist in the choir. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, and her partner comes, and, and the reason he came to our church is because he wanted to be a part of the feeding program once a month when we go to the shelter like we did today. All that food gets carried down to the shelter, and we provide a hot meal once a month. So he started making cookies for that. He doesn't necessarily believe what we preach, but he's here every Sunday. And so my feeling is, you know, a lot of the people who were here every Sunday before didn't believe what I say every Sunday, so why, why should it matter that you don't believe? But they want to be a part of it because they think we're living out the message of Jesus in terms of loving, caring for our community in meaningful ways, and they see purpose in that, uh, that they're willing to come and sing a few hymns and, and sing in the choir even, um, because they like to sing. Um, so people are engaging at whatever level, and because we don't draw a line in the sand and say, you're only a believer if you do this, or you're only a part of us if you, I mean, membership has a certain level of uh, expectation, but you can be a part of this congregation and never be a member. Um, and we, we don't really, you know, treat people differently. This coming Sunday, I do a Evolution Sunday sermon every year. And, you know, I mean, it's closest to the birthday of Darwin for all, you know, because we trust science. We know that the planet is billions of years old and that the universe is 13 billion years old. And, and we're comfortable with science. And we think faith doesn't have to be put at risk because of that. So our older folk just, they love to laugh and, and uh, enjoy being a part of a progressive community. Reverend Newcomb's church sounds like a very welcoming place. It's nice to know that I would be welcome even if I didn't believe everything said from the pulpit. I can also understand that in this era of denying climate change and misinformation about how COVID-19 is spread, a church that embraces science might appeal to people across all generations. Yeah, John, I have a lot of respect for Brian in this congregation. I've worshiped there on several occasions, and it is a very welcoming place. Well, next, we are going to hear from Elizabeth Spidell about the Champion Intergenerational Center, a model program that integrates adult daycare with a preschool and students from the Ohio State University who are studying various issues related to older adults. I think an intergenerational center takes on many, many different forms. Here at Champion, we're a community university collaboration. Uh, so Ohio State University collaborates with two community partners. One is a preschool, so that's Columbus Early Learning Center, and it serves children from six weeks to right before kindergarten, so five years old. And the other community partner is National Church Residences, Centers for Senior Health, which operates an adult day program. And then we have OSU as a partner, so we bring in Ohio State students, nursing, medicine, and social work. For both populations, uh, young children and older adults, they, uh, I would say, are not incredibly valued by our society. Um, for the young children, it's kind of like, great, someday you'll be a value to us. And for the older adults, it's a thanks for your service, but uh, we're all done with you now. So really getting that sense of, of purpose and value for everybody is, is incredibly important. And so for the older adults, um, there's a, a couple of different ways that it really serves um, and, and benefits them. They work with the children twice a day for specific intergenerational programming, which is they'll come in for either art therapy or for music therapy. And for us, that's sign language music. So there's a therapist who comes in and teaches them so different songs and the signs for that. So in those programs, the older adults are helping the children. Um, they're sharing their experiences. They're really engaged um, with, the ch with both the children and the staff. There's definitely a mood uplift. Uh, there have been periods where we haven't done intergenerational programming in the four and a half years that we've been here. Um, a lot of times it happens around August Right, there's a lull because the preschool is closed for a little bit, kids are going to kindergarten, there's just a lot of transition that's happening. And I think it was after the first year, there was an older adult who was you know, the highlight of intergenerational programming. Everybody loved this guy. He had a special name, the Domino Man. And 
during this period, he said, I asked him how he was doing and he wasn't doing well and he just talked about, right, like I'm not really that important anymore. I don't you know, do anything. And I was with a student and we were both really taken aback because that was not our experience of him at all. He was literally the rock star. And I talked about how surprising it was to him and he was like, oh, whatever. And intergenerational programming started and within a week, the difference in just his affect. And also I said, you know, how he was doing and he answered with his like typical fabulous, like wonderful. And I asked him, I said, you know, wow, there's a big difference in how you were feeling a couple of weeks ago. And he said, well, you got, you started doing what you should be doing every, all the time, which is bringing the kids back in. So there's people who can actually articulate that. They also eat lunch in the same room. And um, we have at various times had something called lunch bunch where people get to, older adults and the kids sit together and eat lunch together. And that's also an, a really fascinating experience uh, because the kids know how to do everything themselves and the older adults are like, is it gonna spill? And um, it doesn't because the kids have practiced for a long time and they are really supportive of that. So there's mood, there's a sense of value, like a real sense of purpose in helping people. Um, so it's a, a number of different ways. Elizabeth, you mentioned that older people and small children are both treated as inconsequential. Why do you think putting them together works? That's a good question. I think for older adults it's a little different because they were valued at points in their lives and now not being valued or considered second-hand citizen. Um, perhaps maybe closes them off a little bit. And kids have, don't have that experience at all. They will basically say and do absolutely anything, um, which is always interesting. And that uninhibited reaction of children really helps, I think, open people up and then they just create these connections. I think it's easier for children to see the inherent worth that we all have. They kind of look at everybody as, as truly being inherently worthy. And it's hard to have someone look and act towards you in that way and not feel better. Uh, it, and that goes true for even children who are um, scared. Right? Some, people can, some of the kids can be scared of older adults, or we have older adults who had amputations. And they would ask questions about it, but in a way that was very like frank and kind of like, why doesn't that person have a leg? And I was like, well, why don't you ask him? And they would ask, and you know, teachers would be, you know, you're trying to, don't embarrass me. There's like a sense of guilelessness that when it's asked from a place of genuine interest like whatever the reaction is it's totally authentic and genuine with kids and that uh, it seeing older adults reaction has been instructive people are, respond to those questions and there has to be I think something unconscious about our awareness of where it's coming from and how much of a difference that makes what happens to little children some of them are kind of hyperactive what happens to them when they're around the older people? It depends. They tend to be significantly like mellower when they're in the spaces. And that doesn't, that's not to say there aren't some days where kids have a hard time and it doesn't make a difference that they're around older adults. Because we're all human and sometimes it doesn't make a difference who you're around. But for the most part, one of the most significant impacts has been when they're with older adults, two things happen. Older adults' energy comes up and the other kids, and the kids' energy comes down. And so they meet, maybe not at exactly the same spot, but they meet close to it. And it's also setting up, like we're not doing hour and a half long programming for children. We're doing, uh, it's from 30 minutes to an hour. And also responsive to the needs of everybody. Like, who, do people need to move? Do people need to get up and, and um, maybe leave the room and come back? But yeah, the impact on kids is really significant. And it, the thing that is so special is when you see relationships between children, uh, a child in an older adult form, particularly a child who right, has some challenging behaviors, will make a connection to an older adult, and then that, they, they are connected. And 
at previous times, uh, we've had, they would just, I would go get them and I would bring them over here to the older adult side and they would play bingo. They'd be with their one person and then they'd go back to their class. And it really did have an impact. And there's children who you'd be like, oh, I'm not sure how this person's gonna respond when they come into IG. And they like make a beeline for their person and everything is so calm. The other intergenerational component is that they're working with Ohio State students. So there are some students who are doing um, reminiscence programming. So working with older adults, um, identifying uh, benefits of kind of like looking back on their lives. And then another program that was started by an Ohio State student two years ago that continues is a program called Music and Memory. If you've never seen the doc documentary Alive Inside, you should. It is incredible. And so the benefits of that particular program and also Reminiscence is how we can help older adults who are suffering from cognitive limitations, primarily as a result of dementia, but for other reasons to become more fully themselves again and engage um, kind of from their whole self. And there's also a sense of purpose because they're really helping students learn how to be social workers and doctors and nurses. Can you share a music and memory experience? I have lots. I will tell you the most recent one, which happened this week. Um, we have an older adult here who has pretty advanced dementia with regard to her memory. She is still mobile. She's still one of the most, uh, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I don't think about life in this terms at all, but like she might be an angel. Like she is the kindest human being I have ever met. So I talked to a student about doing a reminiscence project with her and she just kind of was like, you know, she kind of repeats herself a lot. I'm not sure if that's really, do, do you think that's gonna be okay? Like, do you, and I was like, well, just try it, but have her listen to music first and then try it. We knew how much she likes the sound of music. They played a song and then this woman talked for an hour and a half, sharing, as the student said, she said, it might have been every story, like, every, like it, there was no repeating, it was just consistent. She kept saying to them, I want to remember your names, like what's your name? And she like asked, there were three students in the room, asked each student their name. And then she went back because she kept forgetting and then she got them all. She remembered each of the students' names. And she's like, I'm gonna remember this forever. I know I'm gonna remember this forever. And I just wanna do a little footnote here that this is the same woman who had had a conversation with a nursing student two years ago who described to the student what it was like for her. And she had again just listened to music and she talked about, um, I know I'm not gonna remember this conversation because of my memory, like I, it's just not happening. And the thing is, is I can feel it coming. It's like a fog that I can see from a distance and I know that it's about to happen and I'm not gonna remember you in a few minutes. And I'm really, so and then she like pauses and kind of like looks away and looks up and she was like, hi, I'm, what's your name? And the student was, right? Like it's a very rare that you can have that opportunity. So this is the same woman who is two years later going through. And so a few days pass, because the students aren't here every day, one of those students comes back to the center and she walks into the office and she's clearly emotional. And I'm, I'm like, you know, what's going on? And she's like, she just kissed my hand. She never says hello to me. She doesn't know, like I know she doesn't know who I am, but she remembered who I was. Because for the very first time she said, it's so good to see you again. And right, like she can't remember her name, but she remembers the experience of being with her. There's a quote, I hope I get it right. It's Maya Angelou's that it's like, people aren't gonna remember what you said to them or what you did to them, but they're gonna remember how you made them feel. And I think about that, like, and these are really what students are learning. It's like this idea of like, they might not be able to engage with us the way we want, like in that kind of like cognitive way, but they are teaching us how to like be present and be in our full selves with our emotions and how we connect with people is so important. Elizabeth's stories about the Champion Center really demonstrate that intergenerational relationships benefit everyone. Another example of an intergenerational relationship is mentoring. Helping young people cope with the challenges of growing older is an important role that we can play as we age. 
Al Schleter is serving as a mentor to a young man in his neighborhood. Let's hear Al's story. I had been involved at the high school in the past, tutoring and things, but I haven't recently hadn't been done doing much. And of course, I was a parent for many years, and I was a teacher, so I kind of missed having an opportunity to use the, the skills that I developed over the years in those areas. Mark and I, have we've done a lot of things one-on-one. -on -one. He's interested in art, and so twice he's come over and my partner Alice gave him a tour of her studio and they talked about art and he brought some of his art objects and seemed really delighted to be able to share what he had done with someone who has that as a profession. Um, a couple times I've had him help me. I've got a big garden and it was, it was the end of the season and but there were weeds and growing up on a part of it so and, and I had to dig the post out. I mean I'm not as strong as I used to be so he helped me dig up all the posts and roll up the wire and then he took the lawnmower and cut everything so got it all ready for winter. It was a big help. We, we spent about three hours that day on it. Uh, and then he's, he and his mother came over for supper, and we had a really nice uh, uh, talk at, at that time. And since he lives down the street, I, we see each other frequently. And Chad, just a day or two ago, we talked for quite a while. He, he was very close to his grandfather, and his grandfather had serious medical issues. I, I think diabetes, because he had his legs amputated at one point. And, uh, when he was on his way home from school, he would go to his grandfather's, not his home, and he would help his grandfather make sure he was okay for the night. And I think even in the morning, he would go and help get him up. So he, and he, he's talked to me quite a bit about how important his grandfather was to him. So that's been a real loss for him. But, uh, you know, I'm old, so I, in some ways I think maybe it triggers some of the memories of, of his relationship with his grandfather. Finally, John, Sharon Williams shares with us how she has become involved in a tutoring program at her local library called Homework Helpers. I had been doing homework helper since 2017, and I just wanted to work with kids. Plus, I, I, you know, I love the library, and it's a place to feel safe and comfortable with, and I enjoy it. I enjoy kids. I enjoy being a part of my community and uh, just keeping it going, you know, paying it forward, you know. I've been working with a couple young ladies, one that's been consistent. She's uh, in the sixth grade doing a lot of math problems so far. Since her mother said she doesn't like homework, especially math homework. So uh, I'm like, okay. So it's been a, a it hasn't been a challenge. She, I'm like, we've talked. You, you just talk to them and her mother sits in the back and, and I'm like, you know, this is not as bad as you think it is. You just have to concentrate and uh, be consistent with it and take your time. Uh, write neatly because math you go off one digit and it just mess up messes up your entire problem like we did last week with a couple of them that she had done them but I checked them and, and a couple of them were wrong because she had them in the wrong order I said neatness is a must when you do math problems she's kind of easing into it and feels a little bit more comfortable and not as intimidated with it so uh it's working out real good. She keeps coming back, so I'm, that's, that's something. I'm, uh, I'm encouraged by that. I am looking for great things for her. Last week, you know, she's, she's reading this series with the Warriors, this Cat Warrior series. And those volumes are that thick. And, and she's read at least 10 of those books. I was just impressed. I'm like, you, you're doing wonderful. You go, girl. I mean, if you can read that series, and those are, those are sick books, and you, you were just excited about that series, she'll do real good with, with whatever she decides to do in life. I have no doubt that. And her mother is going to see that she moves forward. For her to even bring her in here and say, hey, look, I'm bringing you here so you can get a little bit of help, and, you know, I commend her for that. In our next episode, we're going to try something a bit different. We'll get to know Al Schleter much better. He's a remarkable man who is a great example of someone who represents the art of aging every day of his life. This podcast was funded in part by the Dayton Foundation, Del Mar Encore Fellows Initiative, and the Ruth Frost Parker Center for Abundant Aging, a program of United Church Homes. 
Audio production and interviews were conducted by Delmar Fellow Eric Johnson. <laughs>